In math, it's often useful to extend principles that work in discrete settings to a range embedded in a continuum, like a smoothly gliding slider along which the pattern naturally unfolds. Take exponents as an example. We initially define them through repeated multiplication, but with the right perspective, we can assign sensible values to inputs like zero, negative integers, and even rational numbers. The next natural question, what about general real valued exponents such as root two? To make sense of such an expression, we require a formal construction of the reals. After discovering the need to fill in the gaps of our current number line, one might casually think of R as a union of rationals and non-rationals. But this is a weak definition. It is merely a set theoretic partition and doesn't provide the structural framework that we need in order to build a robust theory of calculus. In this video, I will provide a brief overview of how that foundation is crafted by collecting the right logical building blocks until the real numbers emerge naturally from the properties that we require. Some like to say that algebra is the study of equality, while analysis is the study of inequality. In algebra, we tend to take the perspective of symmetry, focusing on how structures behave under various transformations and how relationships between variables remain balanced and equal. In analysis, there is a greater emphasis on approximations, comparisons, and the local behavior of functions around a point. While statements about equivalence do appear in analysis, they often arise as consequences of some underlying order or limiting process. So let's begin with some strong definitions of inequalities using an approach that generalizes their role in mathematics. An ordered set is a set paired together with a well-defined order relation. It describes a sensible and structured arrangement of elements in which all pairs can be consistently compared according to the order relation. The real numbers are, with their usual order, is a classic example. There are others, such as the dictionary order, which can be used to compare words. Think of it as the way we organize words in a dictionary. We start by comparing the first letters of two words, and if they're the same, we move to the second letter and so on until we find a difference. This order can be extended to sequences of elements like pairs and can be applied to 2D lattices or more complex structures. Now, we haven't yet provided any form of categorization of R. However, this does give us some direction since it can be agreed that such a set would satisfy these axioms. Another set of axioms that our construction should satisfy is that of an algebraic field. We further distinguish R as an ordered field, since its field operations are compatible with the ordering. It should be noted that an ordered set may not always be an ordered field. The complex numbers, for example, can be given an order on their elements, but no order is compatible with their field operations. Next, 
we want to infer what qualities are possessed by subsets of this ordered field. In the same way that the well-ordering principle characterizes the natural numbers, we seek an analogous description of R. Let X be an ordered set. For a given subset of X, we start with definitions of upper and lower bounds. Most math students by this point are familiar with maxima and minima of real-valued functions. We can view these as upper or lower bounds that are actually contained within the set itself. For a hypothetical set containing all real numbers, any subset with an upper or lower bound would have infinitely many such bounds. But what about when a set is bounded and has no maximum or minimum? Well, we can still single out an element by defining the least upper bound, the supremum, and the greatest lower bound, the infimum. These are more subtle and fundamental. You can think of it as taking the set of all upper or lower bounds of a set and finding a maximum or minimum of it. An ordered set is complete if every non-empty subset that is bounded above has a least upper bound, or every non-empty subset that is bounded below has a greatest lower bound. For an ordered field, these two clauses are equivalent, assuming one guarantees the other. Most textbooks use the least upper bound property as the definition of completeness. Notice that the rationals do not have the completeness property. A construction of R is essentially a proof that there exists an ordered field that is complete. I want to stress that this isn't just some useful property that R has which we prove. This is, in essence, what defines the real numbers. It's a way to uniquely categorize this structure that has no gaps. This is why I think it is healthy to restrict our study of real numbers to just R1 for now. Once you try and generalize to R2 and above, there are quite a few notable differences, and a lot of techniques involve a reduction to some result in R1. The actual full proof of the construction is long, tedious, and typically appendixed in textbooks or skipped over in lecture-based courses. What is important to take away is that we can build R in different ways and there is value to understanding each one individually. Dedekind cuts define real numbers as special subsets of the rationals. Another approach characterizes them as equivalence classes of convergent sequences. Both constructions ultimately produce the same structure, a complete ordered field. Though they come from different perspectives, Dedekind cuts emphasize order and partitioning of sets, while Cauchy sequences take the perspective of convergence with respect to a metric. Each can be shown to imply the other, so neither is weaker. You can think of it as two roads to the same destination.
One of the first results that can be derived from the completeness of real numbers is what is called the Archimedean property. It is a mathematical statement that expresses two key facts which are related. First, we show that the naturals grow without bound, then use that to deduce that the reciprocal of naturals can be made arbitrarily small. The proof is neat because it combines the idea of unboundedness with boundedness. While this result may seem trivial, it's actually quite crucial. It ensures that there are no infinitesimally small or infinitely large real numbers relative to the naturals. This property underpins the dual density of R. I want to clarify that we have already declared that between any two real numbers is a real number. And again, this isn't something that we proved, this is just part of what makes the real numbers what they are. To wrap up, let's resolve the lingering question around real-valued exponentials by putting them on some solid ground. Now that we have a tight grip on what we mean by real numbers, we can describe these expressions with no ambiguity. This opens the door to a formal treatment of radicals, logarithms, and much more, all grounded in the solid framework of a complete ordered field. This method of extending patterns derived from sequential steps in this way is a recurring strategy in analytically focused math. So the answer to the question of what is a real number ultimately comes in the same form as the answer to what is a vector. Outside of formal math, vectors are often described simply as objects with magnitude and direction. Just as many people describe real numbers as numerical values, an infinite string of digits. In formal mathematics, however, we prefer to define objects by the properties they satisfy, and use that as our foundation. So even if it feels like a non-answer, mathematicians like to say that a vector is an element of a vector space. In much the same way, we could say that a real number is an element of the complete ordered field. <laughs>